the iLab infrastructure, it's sort of like the old, uh, uh, the old analogy of, you know, for any gold rush, there's got to be the miners, but there's also got to be those that sell the pickaxes to the miners. And I think uh, infrastructure is, is that in many ways. It's a, it's a tremendously, actually, innovative area. And these guys are going to talk about this some. Quick, my name is Steve Yenrich. I'll introduce myself in the panels here in, for, in a second, but just quickly kind of what we're going to cover. And then I'm going to mostly turn it over to them and to you stalwarts here that just can't wait to hear and talk about infrastructure. Um, the panel here is going to introduce you to some of the new technologies that are becoming available for scalable, enterprise-grade Office 2.0 applications in large corporate environments, as well as for SaaS vendors. And I think right there, we're going to have some interesting dialogue about the differences as well as the similarities for creating products for the two. Basically, we're going to carve out a few of the issues that you know, oftentimes take a whole lot of time in corporations, uh, oftentimes months and years and millions of dollars to sort of go through the analysis of. And we're going to try and hit a lot of those issues in about 45 minutes. Whether you're a uh, software as a service vendor yourself, or an enterprise IT professional, and we've had a few of both um, on the different panels as well as in the audience. Um, we're going to go through some of the complexities here that you'll see. The panelists are from companies like 3Terra, Oracle, RPath, and TIBCO. And um, sometimes what they'll talk about is complementary, and I suspect it's sometimes a little bit uh, opposing, but um, you know, that's kind of the fun of it. So we're, uh, we're not a vendor neutral panel. Um, we're all vendors, and I think we all uh, are users too, and so we've got our perspectives on both what the, the different companies do and, and, um, and also what uh, we see from our customers in the industry. So quick intro, I'm Steve Genrich, and um, I'm the Chief Learning Officer of BSG Alliance Corporation, and we're, you know, I've heard mashups used a lot here to, uh, over the past couple of days. We're kind of a mashup uh, services company. You can kind of think of us as a little bit of a combination of McKinsey, Accenture and uh, sort of an applications platform provider, so um, uh, sort of a different kind of services business. Vishal, who's on the, the far end, if you'll wave your, wave your arm, Vishal's been a developer and manager in the integration and BPM industry for a dozen years. And besides leading development teams in multiple time zones, he's out evangelizing Oracle's BPA solution with customers, partners, and analysts. And uh, interesting note about Vishal, the best time of his day is the morning jog while his daughter rides her bike. Didn't tell you this was going to be a human interest panel, too. Um, <laughs> Brett, wave your hand, Brett. Brett is VP of Engineering uh, at our path, the company that created the software appliance and virtual appliance approach for application distribution. We'll have a lot more to say about that. Prior to joining our path, Brett served as the CTO and Vice President of Engineering for Versata, provider of business rules management products for enterprise application development. That is a mouthful. Acquired by Trilogy in 2006. He is a serial entrepreneur, glutton for punishment Absolutely. from down under, uh, and for flying. He's caught a 6 a.m. flight this morning to be here with us. And he has bootstrapped three technology companies, including Verve. Matt? He's been with TIBCO for a decade, and uh, as all of us sometimes think, seems longer than it actually is. He's had a variety of roles at TIBCO, for hardcore developer onwards through three continents and ten cities. He currently runs TIBCO's product management and strategy organization out of Palo Alto. And uh, the human interest note on, on him, when not attempting to manage TIBCO's broad portfolio, he is just a regular gaming geek like the rest of us, and has been slightly curtailed due to a growing family. What's your favorite game? Gear of War at the moment. Gear of War. Excellent graphics. <laughs> and last but not least, a substitute. A substitute. Right. Uh, my name is Bert Armijo. I'm the co-founder and VP of product management for 3Terra. Uh, I've been with the company since its founding about three years ago. Uh, prior to that, I was co-founder and uh, VP of marketing for Topspin, now part of Cisco after the acquisition a couple years ago. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, co-founder and VP of marketing for Rapid City Communications, where we built the first uh, L3 and gigabit Ethernet switches in the 90s, now part of Nortel. So, Bert, I'm going to let you go first. Uh, okay. We're going to sort of throw one question out to the audience and then the rest, or to, to the panelists, and the rest is out to the audience and for you to uh, ask questions. And uh, if, if you run out, we'll engage, and I'll throw a few in myself. So, first for you, Bert, 
What does infrastructure mean to you in the context of Office 2.0, and which pieces do you firmly believe are critical to success? Well, infrastructure is a word that's used uh, in different ways by different people. However, um, if you take a look around the floor outside today, you'll see that there's numerous Web 2.0 and SaaS companies. And each of them has code that they're standing up that is their application, right? Some code that they've written. And for most of the applications out there, that's some HTML, some PHP, maybe some Perl, maybe some Java beans, and a database schema. And yet to make that run, there's a whole lot of other gear that's necessary. Right? Whether you're going to co-location or whether you're going to rack space and getting a managed service, um, you still have to deal with all of the hardware and software underneath that code. So everything from the wires, the uh, firewalls, the routers, the switches, the VPNs, the NAS or SAN, the servers themselves, Linux or Windows. Um, and then on top of that, you've got Apache, JBoss, MySQL, Oracle, some type of database, some type of, of Java server. All of that has to be configured and gotten to operate and maintained before the code that is actually your applications does anything. And yet it is not your code. It far outweighs your code in terms of the amount of lines of code actually running, typically in terms of the number of configuration options, usually also, obviously, in the number of elements that have to be managed. That's infrastructure. Everything that your application sits on top of and takes advantage and that you have to maintain or somebody has to maintain for you in order for your application to be available on the internet. Yeah, okay. I like to think of it as everything under the waterline on the iceberg, and if you don't pay attention to what's under the water, it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of stuff, and it's very important, but you tend not to see it or think about it very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, go ahead, Matt. All right, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I've, been, uh, I've been doing this for too long, but there's kind of two ways to look at it. One is, it's whatever the customer defines as infrastructure, which is going to be different from every case. But it generally is all the crappy, shitty stuff that no one ever wants to touch or do. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, you hear customers, when they talk about infrastructure, it's, it's never seen, it's never heard, but it's always the thing to blame. And it's always the, the difficult crap that no one ever wants to deal with. But again, always gets the blame. So it's, you know, it, it differs from customer to customer. You know, some customers would go all the way up to application and look at application common components as their infrastructure. Other people look at the uh, at hardware as their infrastructure. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's such a fungible term. And how do you feel when uh, when those same people also say, and the reason for that is because it's a commodity item, and so it doesn't really get the attention? How do you react to that? Uh, you know, having come from the uh, from the messaging space. We've, we've heard over the last decade that messaging is going to be commoditized. Mm. And it happens, and you get a couple of new vendors in the space, and then it goes back to being IBM and Tibco and a few other people. And then it comes back again, and you go, you go through these cycles. I mean, commodity is such an overused word. Mm -hmm. Today, it doesn't, what does it even mean? Mm -hmm. right, the market is commoditized, the technology is commoditized. Yeah, we just, we just don't really see it. I mean, more infrastructure is, is the more the point is it's not seen and it's not in the face of the, the end user, the person who's actually trying to do something to work. That tends to be more the issue than it's, uh, than it's just commoditized. Michelle, I'll give you a shot at Office 2.0 infrastructure. Yeah. I would take a take on the So my take on, on infrastructure is standards. Mm -hmm. uh, if your infrastructure is standard compliant and that is what is going to make it interoperable, and, and hopefully you'll get lesser blame going forward. Uh, take an example. One weekend I decided to, to get handy and put a dishwasher in my kitchen. 24 inch, you know it, you buy it and you put it in. How hard can that be, right? And then you discover that, okay, one particular knob is missing. And you go to any, any hardware store, you say, this is what I need. And the guy gives you a piece of metal. You come back home plug that in, and you're done. That is the beauty of standards and compliance with the standards. And I think that's, that interoperability of various components is something that needs to bubble up all the way to, to IT and software. So extend that a point, and maybe you're going this way. So extend that a point. Whose standards, what standards are you talking about, and which standards are the standards missing? Whatever the difference. 
whatever the vendor sees as being important, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the problem with standards that, that, that we see is that this is a micro-macro problem. At the micro level, we can all turn around and say, yeah, we agree on certain common standards. Oh, but, TCPIP, right? Yeah, 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 that yeah. Right. Okay, we all really agree that TCPIP is, is there, right? Yeah. Done. But, but then, you, then you look at the broad spectrum of standards that are out there, and specifications that are not even standards. And then you, you look at individual vendors and you're trying to piece together. So the individual Lego blocks might fit together, but the shape of the entire Lego piece that you're trying to build may be completely different. All right, and you've also got you know, the standards emerging, they're diverging, and it's, it's very difficult for you to say it's just a, you know, infrastructure is just about standards. And also that the infrastructure has to do something, otherwise people wouldn't pay for it, which we hope they pay for. So, so, so understood. <laughs> Uh, any particular area of standards that's more needed now than another as you look into what, uh, what's occurring in the, the Office uh, 2.0 space? If, I think that the, the couple of areas that we see is identity and security keep coming up and up and up. And you know, It took such a long time to get even a, a half-baked web server security standards out there that you know, it's, it's just still not even there. It's not easy. And I think that's, that's part of the problem with those specifications. It's not easy to do anything, and they're so limited. Um, and that, that, for an Office 2.0 discussion, is a, is a big deal. Mm. Well, well, the timing of standards is always very important, right? Because one of the standards do two things. One, they allow things to interoperate. But two, as a consequence of that, they also stifle innovation in a space. They allow innovation at the next level up to accelerate, mm. because what happened down below is now standardized. And so if you try and create a standard too early, what happens is that you haven't actually identified the services that are necessary at that level properly, and the standard doesn't get widely adopted, and then you've got something worse, right? You've got people that say you should stick to a standard, and yet it doesn't actually do what the customers want to yeah, do. I, mean, I think in the previous panel, they were, they were talking about JSR 168. I mean, that is the biggest waste of time we've ever seen, because it was, it was kind of evolved before people actually worked out what they were trying to do. Right. Right. And, and that comment about standards don't lead the industry, the industry leads the standards, Absolutely. is really the way it ought to be, okay? You, you can't understand a problem well enough until you've tried and tried and tried again and probably failed a bunch of times to solve it. And then you've learned enough collectively about the nature of the problem as to how to solve it effectively. TCPIP, I made the glib comment before we all agreed on that. Look how many years it actually took for that battle to get fought. I've and got many won. scars on my back from Oh, yeah. yeah. But we had token it, ring, we had all sorts of An stuff. example that's going on right now, and it's just something that's going through the blogosphere, and it doesn't affect uh, Oracle or Tibco, but it does affect you and I, right? And that is that there are some bloggers who are asking for a standards effort around how to launch uh, uh, an application image or a virtual machine sure. image um, yep. in a utility computing service. Specify and, the standard. Yeah. Is, is there a standard name? There is no standard name yet. It's just this debate. is something. It's a okay. debate. Should okay. we start well, uh, an effort? Is yeah, the question. Right. What, should there be one now? Well, is the guys, time create right? one now. Just, just, yeah, yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of bloggers. Well, on we just, just create one. Yeah. You and I will agree, and everybody else yeah. will be screwed. Exactly. <laughs> I, I like open Bert. You know. There we go. I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> but it, it, it's you know it's interesting because there are, it shows that users want to see that happen. At the same time, there's only a couple services up on them uh, and running at the moment. So to try and say that we understand the scope of the problem to actually create the standard is kind of crazy, which has been my, repost, my uh, response on the blogs. Um, and yet we know that in a couple of years it will become incredibly important for people that our path and, and, and 3 Terra and, and several others are operating. I mean, we have a vested interest as a vendor Absolutely. supporting multiple platforms to ease our economic burden of developing against all those platforms and managing against all those platforms to have a standard. So we are a participant in that birthing process as much as we are perhaps wanting to steer it and channel it in a certain direction, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we want one. Yes, okay. but, but, but I guarantee you that if we were in a room right now and, you know, say, went to ANSI or to, uh, to IEEE or some other standards body, um, you and I would be on opposite sides of the aisle, yeah, right? Because on, on our, scope, our scope of the services we want from that utility computing service are so greatly different, sure. right, yeah. because of the way we operate, um, that we'd probably be beating each other right. up over the head. Plus, we both have very different visions of the problem we're solving right now. That is true. And, and your vision will skew your wants and mine likewise in the other direction. So, yeah, so it's, you know, to some extent, it's, uh, you know, APIs, yes, you know, standards, no. I mean, there's an industry, well, API yes. Itself. API itself is a standard. Well, sure. Even agreeing on those is actually well, probably more difficult. So. No, no APIs, right? <laughs> we, we, do everything, we do everything below that level, so we have no APIs. Yeah, see your, an ad campaign with a big circle and a strike through <laughs> APIs right there. So it's, it's magic. Can I, can I steal that and use it? Absolutely, okay. yeah.